Hello all and welcome to the Fantasy and Sci-Fi Fanatics Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Kubal. Today I have with me a very special guest, Richard Lee Byers. Richard, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, I, I am ecstatic. I started reading Forgotten Realms when I was in eighth grade. So <laughs> I uh, <laughs> once I, you know, came along your books, I was like, oh, this is really, really cool. And I felt like you had a very interesting take, um, you know, on your books and you had so many cool characters and you know, it's, it was just interesting to see, you know, that whole, I don't know, I don't want to give, give too much away for our interview, but yeah, it's, it was really cool to, you know, to have you on the show. Uh, I loved your books. I, I loved like Eric Scott's Bry, uh, you know, Elaine Cunningham. So really, really cool to have you on. So really appreciate you coming on today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I'm very glad to be here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so we'll start with that first question. Uh, what has your writing journey been like up until this point? And we'll add that second one here in just a sec. So I'm just curious, because this is the one that everybody always loves. So yeah, what has your writing journey been like up to this point? Well, I started writing way back in the 80s. And um, what had happened was I'd always kind of known I wanted to be a writer ever since I was a kid. But uh, I also listened to all the people who said, well, you would never make a living at that. You need to, <laughs> uh, you need to do something uh, you know, you do need to have like a real job and then write on the side, which is kind of like, it's kind of like good advice and bad advice at the same time, I think. Uh, so anyway, I got into the uh, mental health field as a profession with the idea I was going to write like on evening, in the evening and on weekends. And I found that to be so draining that when <laughs> I came home, the last thing I ever wanted to do was sit down and write a story so I didn't do that anyway uh, over the course of time I kind of got burned out on mental health field and uh, uh, then my mom passed away and left me some money and it was like okay this is enough money to live on if I live poorly you know? <laughs> yeah and, I do. Uh, and so I thought well if I'm ever going to write I need to um you know, I, I, it needs to be now. I need to either do it now or, or acknowledge to myself that I'm never really going to do it. And so I, I left my job and started writing. And uh, within uh, a couple of years, I, um, you know, I, I had, had sold a book. And, uh, but unfortunately, it was horror. And I got in, it was like, a, I don't know if anybody who's listening to this is going to be old enough to remember, but. Um, I, at the end of the uh, 1980s, the horror move, boom that was going on at that time collapsed. And all of a sudden I could, you know, you couldn't sell horror books anymore. Certainly if you were like an obscure beginner like me, you weren't gonna sell a horror book anymore. So um, I was looking for something else to do. And I always knew that I wanted to do horror and fantasy both. And uh, so I said, well, I, let's, let's see about fantasy. And I was also a big D&D player. And I knew that uh, uh, these Forgotten Realms books were coming out. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a fantasy guy. I'm also a D&D guy. I know I can write these. And um, so I contacted an editor at um, uh, Wizards of the Coast and, and said, you know, and, and basically made that pitch. And they said, uh, well, why don't you write, try to write a short story for this anthology we've coming out, got coming out called Realms of Mystery, which is Forgotten Realms Anthology and said, you know, if we like it, we'll buy it, and we'll probably, you know, get you more work, and uh, so I wrote a short story, and they did like it enough to put it in that anthology, and everything kind of built from there, and I started, um, I started kind of pitching myself to other, uh, other projects, which were what they call shared world projects, where you're working on somebody else's intellectual property, mm -hmm. so I went and ended up doing a lot of those over the years, and um, also, but continue to do some of my, you know my own stuff off and on. Like I have a, um, I have a, uh, a, a dark fantasy uh, kind of urban fantasy book called uh, uh, Blind God's Bluff, which I assume a lot of people have not read, <laughs> but it didn't did do that well. But it's an example of something that it shows that I've continued to try to keep my hand in with my own stuff too. And currently, I'm. Uh, Currently, I'm out of Forgotten Realms, unfortunately, because they decided, the company decided they weren't going to do yep. any more Forgotten Realms books except those by Bob Salvatore. Of course, of course, he was far and away the best seller. And, and now I think Hickman and Weiss have a new Dragonlance book coming out. Yeah, so the, yeah. the, the really heavy hitters, you know, they're, they're still going with, but the rest of us, they decided 
they could live without us for the time being. So I've drifted from that on to um, other things. Notably, I'm doing uh, uh, books based on the Marvel Comics universe for a publisher called Aconite Books right now. And that's kind of been it so far. I was really excited to see some of the other books that, you know, obviously I've read the Forgotten Realms books. Um, uh, and I was excited to see some of the other books that, you know, I didn't know that you had written and they looked really, really interesting. And the concepts to me sounded like exactly like the kind of thing I like, because I don't like straight fantasy. I don't like straight horror as much or straight sci-fi. I like, I, I tend to like the blends a lot more and somebody yeah. coming up with an interesting idea. And I just, I thought that was really cool. And like I was saying before we started recording, I feel like you were able to do that with the Forgotten Realms books. And it wasn't just like the same old, same old, you know, and I just felt like you had a lot of really good horror moments, you know, in a fantasy setting. And it was really interesting, you know, from a, a reader's perspective with somebody that was interested in writing, because I thought, you know, hey, this, this is the kind of thing I like. And I thought you can do this, you know, and I didn't really see a lot of that uh, for myself until I got into your books within the realms. So it was really cool to see, you know, that somebody is doing what I like, you know, especially what I like to read, especially at that time, because I feel like traditional publishing, you know, for fantasy, there really wasn't uh, a lot of difference. I feel like there was just the same old, you know, pe people go on adventure, they do these things, and then, you know, you get two books later, and then it's done. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was very interesting to be able to read your stories within the realms personally. So I really like those. Well, Fritz Leiber, who's one of my all-time favorite, oh, yes. you know, basically said that, you know, sword and sorcery stories were horror stories, which with, with uh, you know, medieval trappings, basically, swords yeah. and horses and castles and all that. And uh, I've, I've always kind of felt that way, too. The, the uh, sword and sorcery writers that I grew up reading, you know, were people like... Uh, Fritz Leiber and Robert E. Howard and Carl Edward Wagner. And there's certainly a uh, strong horror vibe underlying their fantasy stories. And they are all writers who wrote straight up horror stories too. So I've kind of tried to, I guess, follow in their footsteps. And uh, to some extent, um, you know, Wizards of the Coast, but the particular assignments they gave me kind of, um, you know, kind of helped me uh, tap and into that a little bit. I've been mean, thinking notably of the uh, the Fae trilogy I did, which was a trilogy that was supposed to uh, really highlight um, the undead of the Forgotten Realms and also to um, show how uh, Fae goes from being a bad place to being a worse place. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, there was a lot of opportunity to do horror in that. And um, I did a book uh, called... Uh, I did a book called uh, Queen of the Depths, which was about, mm. about the evil goddess of the sea. So, you know, once again, you can work some horror into that. And yeah. uh, so I, I was, um, you know, it was good. I've always, always tried to approach my Forgotten Realms books a little bit in terms of saying, you know, well, there's so many Forgotten Realms books. What can I do that somebody else hasn't already done and done well or is doing and doing well? It's, um, like I did the um, Brother of the Griffin books that came out of oh, the yeah. trilogy, <laughs> and um, and a part of the reason I did those was I thought, well, I, I don't, I'm not aware of other Forgotten Realms books that are about a mercenary company, but clearly that's part be part of life and war in the Forgotten Realms. So let's do something with that. I'd read Bernard Cornwell's books about mm. uh, you know, his, his historical military fiction and that kind of influenced me that I thought, well, you know, maybe I could do something. I'm not, I'm not nearly as good a writer as he is, but maybe I could do something that kind of uh, captured what was good about those stories and why I liked them so much. And um, so that's, um, you know, like I said, I've always tried to go a, go a little bit different. When I did uh, the um, first book in... Um, R.A. Salvatore's War of the Spider Queen, Dissolution. Oh, man, that's such a good, such a good book. <laughs> like, yeah. I was well, like, I was so thrilled after getting done with that one. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, reading that book, I uh, working on that book, it was kind of like, well, well, there's a number of technical problems with working on that book that I had to solve. But one, but one thing that kind of stood out for me right away is that, uh, okay, who's, all, who's already done Dark Elf books? Well, Bob Salvatore and Elaine Cunningham 
great, you know, and, and, then, <laughs> and then there's going to be me, right? I wouldn't want to follow them. <laughs> yeah. Then there's going to be me, and, I, and it's like, and your book is going to be set in Menzo Berenzon, you know, and it's like, and so I just kind of really, you know, poured over everything, read all of the books that Bob had done at that time, read the, uh, you know, the source material, and I thought, I thought, well, I'm going to try to write about Menzo Berenzon and Dark Elves in a way that hadn't been done before. You know, it's like wherever, I mean, the, the other, the Bob and Elaine had did it, had done it brilliantly, you know, but, uh, you know, they went to certain places and they didn't go to other places. And I thought, well, the places they hadn't gotten around to going yet, those are the places I'm going to. <laughs> and I mean, it seems to have worked out okay. Most people seem to like that book pretty well. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I and uh, I, I'll be honest, I, I didn't really get much further in the series yet because I was just, um, because each of you took a different book for that one, right? In terms of the, that one, right? Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. well, they came up with the idea that, um, they came up with the idea that they were going to pick, uh, you know, six relatively kind of up and coming Forgotten Realms not, novels at that point. And they were going to try to uh, build us a bigger following by, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically writing Bob Salvatore's coattails is what it came <laughs> down to. So they came up with, uh, you know, Robert, R.I. Salvatore's War of the Spider Queen. And, um, and then each of us would write one book and there'd be a, there'd be a, there was an overarching plot to the series and you had to, um, you know, you, you had to cover your, you had to get the business that was supposed to be in your volume done. Mm. So you, it would say what was going to, it would say what was going to happen. And it was according to the over the very vague overarching outline. And it would uh, basically take the characters to where they needed to be for the next guy to pick them up. I of course had the easiest job because I was, you know, the first person. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was, I mean, like I said, the overarching outline was, was clear, but it was left all, all the de all the details pretty much to you so um so you know everybody that everybody that wrote after me had to ha had to deal with the choices that the previous writers had made whether they liked them or not as the first guy up i didn't have to do that i only had to deal with what was in the outline so i had the easy <laughs> job see i just felt like i i actually read it uh about two, uh two years ago and then i got kind of swamped for the pandemic but my, my friend had just suggested because um, he asked me, you know, like your other books, like which ones I really liked. And I was talking to him about it. And he said that when he went through, like he, he loved all of them, but mm -hmm. he felt that <laughs> he just felt that doing yours first, like he felt like he needed more time in between um, each author. And he said that he wished that he had done that. So I was like, oh, I'll just read a couple books and go back. And then sure. I haven't gone back because I've been going with some other realms books. Um, I'm actually about to start your Haunted Lands. Um, actually, oh yeah, on, but my yeah that's read. the Fae trilogy thing. That yeah, I was yeah. About. Well, I've, I got to say, I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to recently, um, you know, who just absolutely love Brotherhood of the Griffin. Um, I actually have a character uh, for my own fantasy setting that, um, like, I just love that relationship that you know the Griffin writers had um, with their mounts. Like, I just felt like you had presented that in a different way than anybody else had before. Um, and it really made me think, you know, in terms of, you know, like you were saying, you know, there's this mercenary company, you know, and just getting those types of people and those types of stories out from the realms. But I don't know, it, it just felt totally different. And I just felt like you had a better grasp on that type of relationship than a lot of other people. And it, there's just so many cool things in there. Um, you know, I just, and I can't tell you how many people I've talked to recently who have gone back and read the series, you know, you're, I think you're, you're the last two there. So uh, the, the mass witches and prop of the dead, I got to say, I, I help people find realms books um, mm -hmm. and try and find them, you know, so they can read them and review them and stuff. And I got about 30 in my car and I got to say those last two for you are the most sought after books, like anywhere. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I, I, I look on Amazon to like use books and like, you know, people are, I see what the apparently people are charging for him and I think yeah. are you crazy you know I, I, I wrote it I don't think it's worth that much money <laughs> I mean they are really good though <laughs> I, uh, I I've told I told my friend because he's like oh blah blah I said well my my thing is is finding them and reading them is really fun 
uh, and, you know, collecting them has, it's just been, you know, a great time over the last however many years it's been since I've been eighth grade, like 20 years. And, you know, it's like one of those things where I feel like when I come across, you know, your last two in a sale, they're two of like the last 14 that I need. And my friend, he's like, we could just buy them. I'm like, I could, I'm like, but you know, finding them for me has always been fun. It's like finding mm -hmm. a treasure and I, I, it's going to be really exciting when I find your last two, because it'll be, like I said, the last like 14 that I need. So, but yeah, it's, it's funny to see how many people though, it's not even, you know, a couple people talked about publication dates and stuff, but really don't think that's it. You know, again, I think that, you know, it's just such a shame, you know, with you and Aaron Evans, sorry, Aaron M. Evans, you know, having such great stories, you know, and other people, and then, you know, everything gets shut down. And I just know so many people who were just loving, you know, the material that you guys were putting out. And we're all very secretly hoping that, you know, uh, Renaissance can go on, you know, kind of like Wizards of the Coast after TSR kind of thing. But yeah, I, well, I would certainly be interested. I mean, it's always been one of my regrets that I uh, set up uh, so much stuff to uh, continue on into the books I thought I was going to write. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then I didn't get to write. I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have left, left so many dangling plot threads. I really wouldn't if I, if I yeah, yeah, yeah. truly thought that I was going to go ahead and, and, and write more. Yeah. Well, so, there's this huge like uh, thing going on with like, the, I don't know if you've seen like some of the realms groups and stuff, but, um, but especially on Twitter where, you know, people were, we're, we're really, really crossing our fingers because you got to think, you know, with, I just feel like with the rise of Marvel, you know, and, you know, I just think that people are more fascinated, particularly with Asgard, you know, like behind you, because you do have that fantasy right. and sci-fi aspect blending together. You know, and I just, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people, I've had a lot of younger people come up to me, you know, online and stuff. And they're like, Hey, you're the guy that gets the books, you know, Forgotten Realms books. I'm like, yeah, I can, you know, I have a bunch of networks and things. And it's amazing to me how many people I talk to, you know, who absolutely, you know, still love them and new people that are getting into them. So can only yeah. hope that, you know, <laughs> one of these days. Yeah, I hope so. I, I have not completely, I mean, I, you know, I try to be, uh, I try to be kind of hardened and cynical about it all. Yeah, because, yeah. You know, it's like, there's really, because there's no point pining for it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not up to me, but I, you know, I, I have not abandoned every last shred of hope that someday I'll get that email or the phone <laughs> will ring, you know, and they'll say, well, you do, do more. I and mean, there's, um, I mean, there's, you know, there's a number of things that, you know, could keep that from happening, though. I mean, even if they, even if they decide to do more books, they won't necessarily be my books. And uh, if they do want more books from me, they won't necessarily be continuations of the series and the characters that I've yeah, already yeah. done. They might decide to start fresh. It's like really anything can happen. Yeah. Or or the nothing can happen, which has happened so far. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 for everybody but Bob and uh, and, and Hickwood and Weiss. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I think it's interesting. I It's just funny how many people I talk to, they're like, oh, and you know, it's just, I was thinking about it the other day, it's just such an interesting, you know, situation because, you know, even with Dragonlance, I, maybe I just, I, I mean, I guess, right, Dragonlance had, you know, maybe maybe as many authors as the realms but it doesn't seem like it i guess i just feel like a I lot think of the realms was actually the biggest I think yeah dragonlance was second biggest i could yeah. be wrong about that i but that's what i always thought i mean in terms you know in terms of i feel like a lot more people wrote trilogies i feel like you guys had a lot more you know a lot more authors had you know maybe a book here uh, you know i just think it was it's crazy to see how many standalones you know like no other no other company or anything i've ever seen has ever been able to do at least in my opinion, from what I've studied, you know, and I'm part of, I just didn't see as that writing community and reading community, like, you know, I haven't seen anything else quite be like that. And I think that's why people are so nostalgic, you know, for your books and, you know, other people's, um, you know, and it's, it's crazy to see, you know, how much of a following that, you know, it still has. So it's just, I, I don't know, it's really cool. Yeah, well, it's certainly one of, <clears throat> by the time that we all got done with it, you know, the, the zillion people that worked on it, starting with, of course, with Ed Greenwood and, and on, you know, on through, you know, it's certainly about as detailed a fantasy world as yeah. you could possibly ask for. I mean, yeah. it, it's, uh, I mean, they did those Volo guides where it's like, if you go down this road, you'll come to this inn and their favorite dishes. So, I mean, that's pretty damn detailed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. 
Oh, well, we kind of kind of talked about that second part of number one, you know, how you came to write uh, in the Forgotten Realms, but you've also written in Pathfinder, is that correct? I did uh, a couple um, a couple short pieces that oh, I, cool. were like on their on their website, as I recall, and oh, okay. uh, then um, then then one novel. I think all of Pathfinder fiction kind of got shut down, like all of Forgotten Realms, except for Bob and Bob stuff uh, got shut down, and so. Yeah, I did one. That was, that was another one where I did have a sequel in mind, although that book that I did is pretty uh, standalone. You know, it wasn't it wasn't like the first book in the trilogy or anything like oh, it yeah. was. To, I just had it. I, I I knew another adventure I would do with that same character, but they, uh, you know, they never asked for it. So that, yeah. that was that. Well, that was interesting. I, I just didn't know that because I, uh, I really I discovered those probably about three years ago. And I really like Tim Pratt's series. Um, with the he has like the ice blade uh, him or whatever and those were really good so I ended up you know finding other ones too and so I've been collecting those too um, I gotta yeah. say everyone... I'm, I'm friends with uh, Chris Jackson who I think has oh, written cool. wrote some nautical or pirate kind of stuff he's uh, a yeah. Chris is a sailor in real life so he's he's oh, a cool. he's a good go-to guy for uh, you know seafaring fantasy and and oh, I, I, I think he did some for them I, I, I believe so. I think that's the one I was actually just looking at the other day. Um, it, yeah, I, I thought that was the one where it's like there's like a pirate on the cover and the monster comes out and it's on the ship. But yeah, they have some. That's really probably cool. Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They had some good authors. I, I was like very surprised. And I'm like, how did I not, you know, see this before? And my friend, he goes, Well, you were so, you know, into Forgotten Realms and Dragonlance. He's like, I don't even think your head poked out of the sand for like a decade. <laughs> and he's like, By then, he's like, they were pretty much shut down. Um, but yeah, yeah, those have been pretty good too. But yeah, I just, yeah, yeah. I really did. I really enjoyed my uh, doing my Pathfinder book because it's kind of uh, it was kind of my love letter to Edgar Rice Burroughs on a certain level. Oh, that's so he, cool! Because he was uh, he was my first big, you know, introduction to the genre. The first writer I really loved when I was a kid, and uh, and my book for Pathfinder is a you know kind of of a land at the center of the earth kind of thing like his Pellucidar stories so uh that that was a lot of fun to do oh that's cool and well, I, I did oh, some, I, I did try to do some specifically burrowsy kind of stuff you know, in, in oh. the story I, I absolutely love John Carter and Mars like I think I'm on like book I think I'm actually on the last book for him and then I got like book one of like his son but I just I can't believe like it's funny because I teach uh, social studies and it's funny that, you know, like, just to see, like, I love his biography and learning stuff about him and Robert E. Howard, like, those, there's just two very fascinating people. And, you know, I just like to look and see, like, what they, you know, it's kind of like, I feel like it's like Tolkien, you know, where people like to, you know, look back and see what his experiences were, you know, and how you're actually able to write them down, you know, in the words and books. So those are two to me, though, that are just, they're just so interesting. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a big Howard fan. You know, I've, I think that Burroughs is somebody I have some trouble rereading as an adult. Mm. You know, I think that it's really not a terrible rap on certain writers to say that they're best discovered when you're a certain age oh, you know, yeah. or when you're young. And I like I when I read Burroughs, I was, you know, you know, captivated by his virtues and kind of oblivious to his faults mm. or his weaknesses as a writer. And when I look at him now, I'm still captivated by all the things he did well, but some of the things he didn't do as well are harder to get past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can I, I, don't, I don't feel that way with Howard so much. You know, I, I, feel like, uh, I feel like his stuff holds up more for somebody who's the age I am now. Yeah, yeah. No, I can definitely see that. I, I was just actually discussing with Scott Odin about this because um, he's, he's written, you know, some Conan stories and things like that. Um, and he's actually looking to expand. Um, he wants to write like full Conan novels. I was like, if I, I told him if I won the lottery, I would make it like the Renaissance, you know, like the patrons. And we, I just get him on Patreon and I would just pay him to write me Conan novels. Um, <laughs> Somebody, some publisher is going to do new Conan novels. Yep. Yep. And, and I, I, I don't remember which publisher or which, or which editor I was. I, I know that uh, I remember I said a, uh, you know, a, 
email or an, a message indicating interest. And, you know, I figured, Ooh. yeah, like me, me and like uh, every other writer in the world, probably. You but know, you and Scott I, would be perfect. Oh, yeah, my I, I never heard anything back. So don't, don't, don't hold your breath for that one either. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, I do, have, I do have a really, what I think is a really strong idea for a Conan story that is something that Howard didn't cover. And uh, I love to do it someday, but like I said, I never heard anything back. So I don't, uh, oh, I don't guess this is going to be the time. Yeah, yeah. These people got to get going. I, there, there were the, um, oh, the Hyborian Age books that were kind of like the young adult books. And I got to say, like, they came out um, kind of like early 2000s, I believe. And every single writer that did those uh, picked a different character. But one of them actually had their character be like a guard for Conan when he was king. And uh -huh. that was super cool. And I mean, the whole world that they like helped to expand, um, you know, for Heboria was just amazing. So I, I, I'm so bummed. They only probably did, I think they did four or five trilogy books and each author took a different character for that trilogy. And it, it was so cool. And they did such a good job. I would love to see them, you know, just give you guys the reins and, you know, do stuff like that. I mean, it would, and I know a lot of people that would buy them too. Like, I just think it's a shame that, you know, I think they're, a lot of people are trying to wait for, you know, kind of Conan to come around again. But I, I like to say that I don't think he's ever really left. And if you look at Grimdark, especially for Indy, I feel like people really want, you know, more Conan like stories and would love the world. And, you know, I feel like you and Scott both would just do an amazing job. So I hope somebody really, you know, yeah. I hope somebody Conan, right now. The, the Conan books by other writers of like, you know, over the years, you see the you know, various publishers, you know, pick them up and do some. So if, um, I don't know if I, if I don't get to tap this time and I don't think I will, it, maybe, next, maybe next time, wherever they, yeah. <laughs> where they land, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm certainly interested in uh, doing that. I, I'd be interested in doing, um, I think Solomon Kane too. Oh, would be, that would, you that would, would be, be my, my second choice. Yeah, I, I think perfect. he's an interesting character. Yeah. I mean, I like, I like the other characters too, but it's like, Call and Brand Mac Morn are enough like Conan that it kind of feels like he might as well be doing Conan, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but Solomon Kane is a different kind of person, and uh, for that reason, I think you know, like I said, if I was if I somehow lucked into being able to do Howard stuff, that would be my next pick. Oh yeah, I feel like you'd be perfect for that. Like you know, I I don't know, I just like um. Like Year of Rogue Dragons for you, like I just love that series. There were so many, you know, great just moments in there, particularly with the dragons. I just felt like you, you felt the way, you know, everybody sees dragons in fantasy, but I feel like in that trilogy, you really made people feel, you made me feel like the dragons were really dangerous. And yeah, I just felt like there was a whole new level of, yeah, just this horror to it. And you know, I just felt like the aftermath of, you know, what the characters had to deal with after the dragons was just awesome. So, but I feel like you'd be able to do that, you know, transfer, um, you know, those villains and the kind of things that Solomon Kane has to fight, particularly with that time period. I feel like you would do a really good job with that. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that'd be really cool. I love Solomon Kane too. I just think that I think a lot of people haven't really, um, you know, don't really know him as well because I don't think people after Howard, in my opinion have done him very well um yeah so i'd love to see somebody like yourself do him and you know i because i feel like he can stand on his own you know and doesn't have to be conan's little brother or cousin or something like i feel like particularly with the rise of urban fantasy um you know with, especially within the last five you know six years i just think that you know i, I was just thinking the other day and talking to a buddy of uh, mine about that we thought that solomon king you know it was you know time for him to come back around and this would be the you know the perfect time so well that would be that's a that's an interesting thing to link it with urban fantasy because if you read the solomon kane stories there isn't one where he's actually in london or paris or some or some you know great metropolitan city of his era and uh, so that would that would be a new new thing to do with him to yeah. do like you know, you know solomon kane adventure in london you know yeah, that, yeah. that it was, it was that that novel I, that would now that i'm thinking about it, yeah if i was going to do it that's what i would probably do yeah well i'm just saying i'm just thinking because there's so many people that i've met who you know who in just in the last what two years 
since like right before the pandemic have written these historical urban fantasies and yeah. I think like well he's the original historical urban fantasy that I've read you know I can't think of somebody before that time you know who you can give credit to and I just think that a lot of people don't give you know Howard enough credit for that character you know right. something different I, I'm like you know and then I had friends that were arguing me about it recently writing friends in a in a group and then you know when they actually did their own research and stuff they're like wait a minute they're like you're totally right and I said, except for, you know, except for Mary Shelley, I said, there's nobody you can, you know, I think you can really give that, that credit to uh, for urban fantasy. And, you know, then, you know, then they kind of turned into a different conversation there uh, with her not getting credit, but between the two of them, I'm like, there's nobody that at least that I've read who, you know, who tops urban fantasy. And I think you need it, you know, I just think people are thinking about urban fantasy different now. And it doesn't just like, I like historical urban fantasy. Um, I, I'm like trying to work on like I always like as a history teacher, I want to know what happened to the lost Roman Legion. Uh, mm-hmm. in England. And my friend goes, well, you love Robert E. Howard and you love horror. And, you know, he's like, why don't you just do something with it and come up with a reason that they disappeared? So right. I'm like, that's a great idea. So I, I made it zombies and I, I, I love the Roman history. So Scott Owen and I were talking about doing like a historical, he goes, you should do a historical urban fantasy. And I'm like, I really should. And <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of people like, you know, that like history are now, you know, kind of going in there because that's why I like Solomon Cain, uh, you know, like to begin with. And I liked Conan too, you know, because he took a lot of those, you know, the picks and things like that from different, you know, historical groups and stuff. So to me, that was just super interesting because it hit, you know, multiple spheres, you know, it was right. fantasy, but it was history. And I just seen a lot more historical, you know, fantasy, I guess, come out or historical urban fantasy, whatever you want to call it. And right. I just think that Solomon Cain, I just think this would be the you know, the perfect time, especially seeing, you know, what urban fantasy stories have, you know, have come out recently. I just think that Solomon Cain in London at that time period would just be super, super cool. So Yeah, I'd love to write that now. I'm thinking, damn, I wish I could write that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. Uh, so uh, for that second question there, um, so obviously you've written in fantasy, uh, you know, in horror and like the mix, but is there one particular, I've seen you mix a lot, you know, of genres yeah. into one, but would you say like you have a favorite or your favorite thing is mixing them together? Well, I, you know, I don't really think of, no, think about it in that way. I mean, it's like um, when I do, um, you know, I, I just think of a particular story and, uh, and kind of go for a particular effect. And uh, it's like with the, uh, with the Haunted Lands trilogy, you know, which is a fantasy with a lot of horror elements, you know, it was just kind of uh, the, the natural way to go, you know, I, I think, um, I'm so, I mean, I think maybe that's kind of, I mean, that's something that I, that's just a place that my brain tends to go, you know, okay. to, uh, I mean, if you're going to write about something like, you know, demons or, or uh, you know, evil magic or something, it, it, it might as well be horrifying, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, uh, but, and, but again, if, but if you're doing a fantasy story, then, you know, you got to have the guy, the heroes who break out the swords and wail on the monsters and stuff too. So it, 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 it just seems like a very natural blend for me. Mm-hmm. And so I, I guess the answer to your question is I do kind of like smearing them together. Yeah, yeah. I just think it, like I said, I think it's interesting because, you know, my friends, we were talking about, you know, like my Roman history one and they're like, oh, that sounds so cool. And my friend, he's a big uh, realms fan as well. He loves your books, by the way. And mm-hmm. he's like, uh, I told him yesterday I was interviewing you today and he was like screaming on the phone. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to text him when I get done. But yeah, it was just, it was cool because he was like, oh, I didn't even think of it. He goes, oh, he's like, you, he's like, you really want to, you know, to write like Richard then for that story. And I'm like, I really do, you know, because I felt like, again, you, you know, you really highlighted the horror aspects and I can't really pick one really good example because I feel like there's so many, you know, and that's why I, I like, I'm actually using your Haunted Lands trilogy as kind of, you know, kind of homework on how to do that because I just think you, and he said the same thing, you know, we just think that you blended, you know, these uh, aspects together so well and, you know, it's just, it, it is a different type of feeling, uh, you know, you don't feel like you're in fantasy or horror, just get this great fantasy story with horror elements and it's almost like i don't know he he said he, he made a good point he said it's almost like you you know created your own genre you know with your realms books 
Um, you know, well, I, I, I mean, I think maybe that's giving me too much credit because, like, as I've already mentioned, there are a lot of other writers who've done a sword and sorcery with a strong, uh, you know, with, with strong oh. horror elements who came long before me. So uh, I, I just kind of feel like I'm following in their footsteps. As far as like how to do it, I mean, I don't think that uh, I never, like I said, I never don't necessarily think of it consciously in that way when I'm writing it. It's more just a matter of, um, you know, giving every element its due. You know, if, if, if there's a, you know, if there's supposed to be an evil presence, well, you know, sell it being evil, you know, sell it being scary. And if there's supposed to be an exciting sequence where, you know, somebody's taken down the monster with a sword, well, you know, sell that, you know, write, write uh, the best actions, choreography you can write, you know, and uh, so, to, I mean, to, like I said, to me, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, milking every element for what it's worth. Hmm. I think that's great advice, personally. I, I actually, I, I don't know, and this is like when Mally Kuhn and I were saying, like, she kind of said something the other day in our second interview, and I was like, why? I was like, I've been thinking about this for like two years straight, and I'm like, I don't know why. You know, sometimes people just say it in a particular way, but I, I like how you said that uh, in particular, because I actually didn't think about it that way. I was thinking like maybe too much of trying to blend things together or to do this or that and get them right. to fit rather than just do this and then do that and then just kind of keep going with the story. So yeah, yeah I think that's great advice. My cat is going nuts to be let oh, out no, of my problem. room here. Let me let the cat out real quick. No was chilling off to the side there for a good bit, but he finally got restless. <laughs> well, with that next one, you kind of mentioned um, earlier, but uh, what are your Dark Origins books about? I thought that that idea to me just seemed really interesting. Okay, well, they they they, they um they aren't all my books. What the, oh okay. um, oh that's good. To know. I, that I've contributed to each of those books. Oh, that's cool. Uh, what uh, uh, there's a. a called Arkham Horror, which is based on the works of H.P. Lovecraft, but it's um, but it's H.P. Lovecraft with a more uh, kind of pulp action, you know. That's cool. You know, or orientation. It's more. It's kind of H.P. Lovecraft filtered through a more Robert E. Howard kind of thing, where we, oh, we're going to go out and fight the love, the Cthulhu mythos. We aren't just going to kind of lie down and go crazy and die, you know. <laughs> And um, anyway, th that was put out by Fantasy Flight Games. And they um, one of the elements of the game is that they have these characters called investigators, right? Oh, who okay. are, you know, who are the guys that are know something about what's going on with the Cthulhu mythos that are trying to keep the lid on so that, you know, that humanity doesn't become extinct or whatever. And um, anyway, I wrote... Um, they, they they decided to do some novellas where they would tell the origin story oh, of, cool. of of these different investigators, and um, I did too. And um, then subsequently, um, Aconite Books, who's now who are now publishing the um, the the new novels based on Arkham Horror, decided to collect these <clears throat> novellas that had been done previously in uh, two volumes called Dark Origins. And I think the second one's gonna be called Grim Investigations. Hmm. So um, one of the novellas I wrote previously is in each of those books. So oh, it, each, it, I can't, I do. So I'm, I'm about a fourth of each of those books because I think <laughs> each of them has four novellas in them. But anyway, that's what it is. It's the oh, uh, cool. origin story of one of these uh, guys who is destined to go out and fight uh, some aspects fight the Cthulhu mythos. And of course, in each story, you have the guy falling over some aspect of it and having to cope. So it's just the, so you guys all wrote on about the same character or you guys each had a different no, character? No, each one, each story is about a different character. Oh, that's cool. In fact, each, each, each of my two stories is, is, is about a different character. Cause like I said, each one is the origin of what one indiv particular individual from this pool of investigators they've got in the game. Oh, that's super cool. We'll have to check that out. I was looking at that and I'm like, that sounded really, really cool and up my alley. And I know a lot of people that, you know, I talked to will really enjoy those as well. How did you come up with your concept then? Was that like you read the game material and then, you know, read the investigators and then came up with a story? Well, basically why well, they sent me a, um, you know, they sent me kind of, it's not the rules of the game, but it's the, the, the Bible for writing fiction about the game. 
which is actually more useful. I've written an awful lot of fiction about games I've never actually played, <laughs> but but you but that's but you don't need to know what size dice are being rolled. You know that's not that's not pertinent. Uh, you need to know. Um, you know, you need to know the, the color of the world and the fundamental concepts. So anyway, they sent me um, they, they sent me a guide to, you know, how to write fiction about the world, you know, what, what the world what the world is like. And then uh, kind of a list of investigators and said, you know, pick one. And uh, I think I think they wanted like a, a pitch, like, how would you do it? I'm not sure. I've done so many of these things for so many different properties over the years. A lot of times I don't remember clearly how I got the particular job. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, the, the upshot of it all was that uh, I wound up writing uh, the origin story of one character and then the origin story of a different character. And, oh, and you'll cool. find one of those stories in each of these two books, if you care to pick them up. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I'm definitely going to be grabbing those. Those just sounded really cool. Um, Let's see here. Oh, I think I forgot one of them. I think one of my questions might have got uh, clipped here. Um, did you? I thought that you had a um, science fiction uh, and then mixed with a fantasy. Uh, you had a couple books, right? Um, Not really. I've only done. Um, I've only done science fiction kind of things just in a couple short stories here and there I mean, oh okay anything like a novel or even a novella that was a science fiction story. Oh, okay although although well i'll qualify that my story in um dark origins is is the the, the one of those Cthulhu myths. it's kind of um because if you read lovecraft he kind of um you know he he kind of mixed in um some science fiction elements with this supernatural horror there are certain elements you can kind of take either way yeah, yeah, yeah. and um i kind of ran with that in, in my story in, in dark origins and uh, then i i actually got uh email from a uh a, a physicist later saying that i'd gotten stuff that i'd done right so <laughs> that, was, that was very gratifying for me I thought that, that's not bad for a you know fantasy and supernatural horror writer that actually got the physics right in this. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Funny. I always worry about that. I was just talking to um, oh, um, a couple of people about that, and <laughs> I was like, I'd love to write you know uh, science fiction, but I feel like I have to get like a science fiction you know uh, like editor or something like that, somebody to uh, you know to call my BS, I guess, <laughs> and actually yeah. do the science part, but. Oh, I, I see. I do. I do have it now. Uh, well, I was looking at your, your the Iron Kingdoms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So did you write two of those then or three of those? I wrote, well, it depends on how you're counting. I wrote um, two complete novels and a novella, which oh, comes before cool. the two novels. So, uh, yeah, I did. Um, yeah, I did, they had a, a, a kind of a small mercenary company there it's kind of like uh i mean it's not really a um it's not a mercenary company the fact it, in the idea that it's, it's like a, an army for hire but it's like it's it's like an adventure adventuring company that you know basically hires out and does jobs and uh so yeah i wrote uh, i wrote some stuff about them oh that's cool so would you say uh what would you classify that genre wise would you say that, that was fantasy mixed with um you know like horror again or would that be well i think that well the iron kingdom stuff to me is kind of um what it's it's fantasy and i mean it does it does have a little bit of horror element to it if you want to bend it that way but it's also it's also i think got more of an overlay of steampunk oh that's really cool because they've got uh they do have kind of uh they do have technology that kind of has like you know cheater magic in it or something you know it's like they have these big uh they have these big robot like automatons but they're that they're you know fed part they they they, they can exist because the magical elements in the setting exist oh, that's super cool and uh, so you know it, it's um and there's some other things that that are um there are some other elements of the setting that are, are you know steampunkish rather than straight up medieval stuff like they've got trains you know so uh, so you could so yeah i would call those fantasy with kind of 
medieval fantasy, but with then with a steampunk overlay to them. And uh, a, a little bit of horror because there's some, you know, there's there's some definitely some grim elements to the setting. Well, those look cool too. So I, I'm definitely gonna have to get those. I just thought that I just love steampunk and when you know I'd seen that you mixed some fantasy elements with it, I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. And I had never read any of those types of books before for the Iron Kingdom. So that really sounds very interesting to me. Uh, and then of course, the uh, you know, the ones I'm really looking forward to. So tell us about your Marvel Legends of Asgard's books and what those are about. All right. Well, um, Aconite Books got the rights to do books set in, in Marvel, the Marvel Comics universe. And um, they've got several subsections within that. They've got, um, they've got, uh, I was want to call it a section called Marvel Untold. And I think there's one called Mar Magical Marvel. And there's one that's like the, the mutants and the X-Men. And then there's the one that's, um, stories set particularly in the Asgard slash Thor slash Loki slash Odin universe. And uh, I, I pitched for, um, I pitched for uh, uh, a lot of the, the different things there, but the ones they decided to give me were uh, uh, Marvel Legends of Asgard. And, um, and so I was trying to think, okay, so what am I going to do with this? And um, I I thought about the character, uh, the various characters that were, were you know readily available to me, and uh, you've got to like go go jump through a couple extra special hoops if you're going to do a story about one of the real super A list characters like Thor, you know. So I knew I wasn't doing Thor, right? <laughs> um, but um, it occurred to me that the character uh, Heimdall was a pretty big deal, and uh, in both you know in, in kind of true Norse mythology and also in uh, you know, Norse mythology as filtered through the Marvel lens. And, uh, but Marvel, I didn't think had done, really done that much with the character, particularly in terms of his early days. Mm. And um, I, if, if those stories exist, I haven't read those. And I've read quite a, quite a bit of Marvel comics yeah. over the years. And uh, so I thought, well, origin stories are always interesting why don't i tell the story of heimdall you know from when he's um you know this this starting with the human being this you know young callow untried uh, warrior out of vanaheim who's just like you know kind of like you know one more warrior in the legions of asgard and uh, then follow his progress as he gradually starts to accumulate the powers and the uh magical gear and whatever that um you know leads to him becoming the sentinel of the rainbow bridge and a true god of asgard and etc and so so um i so those are the books that i've been doing i the first one was the head of Mimer, which came out uh, last year and the new one is the rebels of vanaheim which uh came out this month in the u.s it comes out in uh in uh, britain um uh, I think in February, which is uh, ironic because my publisher is fundamentally a, a British publisher, but the books are, are printed in the, the books, I guess, are printed in the U.S. and then they are go by ship over to, um, I think it's, is it Milan? Uh, I, and then from Milan, they go to uh, Britain and because the, you know, of supply chain issues and everything has been going on, the books actually end up coming out in the U.S., earlier than they come out in Britain, except as, as e-books. But anyway, so the, so the Head of Beamer is the first one, the Rebels of Anaheim, the new one's just out, is the second one. I got to say, I, I love Heimdall's character in mythology. I really loved him in the Marvel movies. So for, I actually, I didn't look this up ahead of time before he came on. So <laughs> I'm really excited to find out that that's what the books are about because I, I loved his character. So for you to do that, you know, and develop that character more is, is super cool uh, to me because I, I, like I said, I love that character. I use this character a lot, um, particularly from the movies and with mythology for, you know, characters of my own. And, um, you know, and I, I, I loved how Iridus Elba played him. Um, I thought he did a really good job. But yeah, that, that's really cool that you're expanding his character. So 
I'm glad yeah, I didn't I, look that up ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, that was a good surprise. Yeah, they're they're a lot of fun to do. I've done, uh, like I said, I've, I've done two so far. I I should mention for you know just in case you know you know to, to warn editors or warn readers that he doesn't he's not a person of color in my books. They, these books are they're they're very clear. They say you're writing about the Marvel Comics universe, not the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, and so if you um if, if you read them don't expect him to look like idris elba because he doesn't <laughs> um the i mean i'd be fine if he did but he doesn't um the uh but uh the, the, yeah the books are i i'm, I'm pretty pleased how the books have come out I've, I've tried to mix in as much um I, with while being true to marvel comics canon which you know I, obviously i should do and um they have readers over at Marvel who will, you know, double check and everything to let me know if I've just strayed from something. So I try to do that, but within that context, I also try to get in, uh, you know, real Norse mythology, you know, the, uh, un unfiltered by Marvel, wherever it doesn't contradict, and also little elements of uh, real Viking culture, you know, wherever I can get that into. It's like whenever, whenever there's something that isn't already specified but in marvel i i look at the mythology and i look at you know information on real viking culture and say well if, if they never said what it's like then it's gonna be like this i mean that that just sounds really cool i i remember i had read i don't know where i found it but there was like one smaller like story um within another like bigger volume uh, that I had read of Hamdel from the marvel comics and it was it was really good um yeah, I just always thought like that was a character that, like you said, like I don't I don't really know a lot about him from the Marvel universe. So to me, that sounds really interesting. I just thought, you know, the movies just to me made that character sound so cool, a lot cooler in my opinion than I don't know. I mean, he's pretty cool in Norse mythology. He's not one of my favorites. Yeah, um, yeah, I like some other people, but I don't know. I just I started looking at him differently, you know, once the movies came out, and I'm like, that is a very interesting character, and I, I've seen some, you know. So different things that people you know have talked about with his background and stuff like that and i always i just always thought that that's somebody who you know really could use more of an expanded character and storyline but i feel like dc does that a lot but i feel like you know marvel in the past hasn't done that with you know certain secondary characters and things like that so it's just cool to see you know somebody you know just focus more on you know those types of characters so that's super yeah. cool well marvel has I mean, they've got so many good characters. Oh, yeah, I, guess, yeah. I guess they they can't all, you know, get the spotlight in a given case. With DC, but I know what you mean about DC. It does. If you read DC, it does kind of seem like everybody who ever met Bruce Wayne, you know, has, yeah, 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 has had a mini series or something yeah, at yeah. some point. Like there is, it's kind of ridiculous when you do think about it, though, because I remember my friend was like. Oh, because like you look at uh, what's his name, Jimmy Olsen or whatever from Superman, and yeah. it's like he gets powers at one point, and does whatever, and there's just yeah, there's so many things. But yeah, I just I don't know. I just had just thought that there are cool characters, you know, in the Marvel universe that you know really could that I want to learn more about, and Hamdel was one of them. Um, and I, I do think it was because of you know Elvis' performance, but I thought oh, I never really thought about him before, you know, in the Marvel universe, and then his character just made me think, well, you know, are there other characters too? And I just feel like once the movies came out and stuff, I'm like, there are a lot of other, you know, people from the comics and stuff that I would like to learn more about. So I just think that that's cool. Like, I hope that, you know, that they keep going with the books personally that you guys are doing. Yeah, there are a lot of, cool. uh, there are a lot of characters who aren't, you know, like I said, you know, super A plus level yeah. characters, but I think there there's some really interesting stories that you could tell about. I mean, I like to do, um, I mean, I like to do a long novel. Oh, he's that'd um, be cool. I mean, he, I've got an idea for one. He's, uh, of course, he's becoming a more prominent character, I think, because of the, at least the, the context of the movies. He's in yeah, all the, yeah. the movies, right? And, uh, but uh, I mean, there's, there's long. I'd like to do a Karnak the Shatterer novel. Oh, that'd be cool. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to do a Damon Hellstrom novel. Oh, that'd be neat. You know, there's um, yeah. I mean, there's there's a, a zillion interesting characters. I, it's just you know, I'm, so you know, we'll we'll see. Uh, hopefully, they will keep uh, they will keep hiring me, and uh, I will. 
that. I said, I'd like to, you know, branch out a little bit and do, do some of the other aspects of Marvel. I mean, I'm not tired of Marvel Legends of Asgard and I've got, I've got already got an idea for another one, which I think is a strong idea, but uh, I, it would be fun to mix it up a little bit and do, uh, you do, do contribute to some of the other Marvel lines too. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's super cool. Well, I, I think a Wong one would be really neat too. I, I really like his character. So that'd be awesome. Uh, I thought of this question, my friend, uh, uh, one of my fellow writers had actually asked me this question. So I thought I'd give it to you. Uh, what advice would you give yourself if you could go back to your first book release? Uh, well, I don't know. The most, well, I guess, I mean, the most basic writing advice was probably given by Robert, Robert Heinlein, and it, it, which is, you know, that you have, you have to write, you have to finish the stories you have to write, you have to submit them, uh, you know, over and over again until somebody buys them or until you run out of markets. And uh, once you've got them to your satisfaction, you don't rewrite them unless somebody says, um, somebody says, uh, you know, if you rewrite this and do A, B, and C, and you agree with A, B, and C, and then resubmit it, I'll look at it again. Otherwise, you know, otherwise all those comments are just, you know, well, okay, you know, but, yeah. but if you aren't willing to look at it again, I'm not going to rewrite it just because you, you said that dude, my time is better spent on something. But I mean, that was all advice that probably people have assimilated before they sell their first book, right? Um, as far as uh, advice that, that uh, I had maybe, I wish I'd paid more attention to during the course of my career, or, was, uh, or wish I had thought about sooner, was that you always kind of want to diversify at least to mm -hmm. some degree you don't want you don't want all your um you know all your uh connections to be to one editor or one publisher or, or yeah. whatever because like i said i got into it writing horror at the right at the end of the 80s when the horror market <laughs> collapsed said uh, if i had uh you know if i had been more you know, diversified at that point, it would have, um, you know, it would have provided a cushion. And uh, later on, there have been a number of occasions when I thought like, well, you know, I always have this, you know, this is stable. Like we mentioned, uh, you know, I've done a lot of Forgotten Realms books. And there was one time I thought, well, I'm always, whatever else is going on or not going on, I'm always going to be a Forgotten Realms writer, right? I'm always going to be doing at least one of these novels a year. And, you know, it turns out to be true. And there have been many other occasions in my career where I thought that, uh, well, I'm always going to be doing this, you know, I might do other stuff too, but I'm always going to have this and then you don't have it. An editor moves on or a publisher decides I'm not going to do X kind of books anymore or, you know, something happens. And uh, you, if, if you've got, um, you know, if you're already working with, with something, um, something else as well it's not quite as bad as all of a sudden it's all the you you got nothing you know because that's all you were doing yeah i think that's great advice personally uh when it comes to writing advice what do you think the most helpful uh writing advice uh that you've had uh in the past or maybe even recently um you mean about the actual technical aspects of writing yeah it could be anything uh like i know like a couple people take that one kind of differently um Okay. Some people well, I, I, I can give you. I give you like two answers. I think one is one is the uh, uh, writing, you know, the tech actually writing stories, and the other is a career thing. Okay. okay. The the um the writing stories thing would probably be you know what what Elmore Leonard said. You know, I I tend to I try to leave out the parts that people skip. Mm. I, I and I think that's really good advice. You yeah. try to. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things that your characters are doing you, because everybody does them that you don't really have to. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really have to cover. You're not covering every minute of that character's life. You're telling a story, and if it's my kind of you know, if it's the kind of thing I write, it's probably sort of supposed to be a thrilling adventure story or a bone chilling horror story. So you you know get on with the parts that are pertinent, you know, don't, uh, uh, and, you know, that, God, there, that's, that's one piece of, there's so many good things about t the technical writing, you know, um, one thing, uh, one thing that a lot of people struggle with is, um, how to, um, 
you know, how much description of characters or settings mm-hmm. or whatever to do. And um, I, I tend to be pretty spare with that stuff because it, it lends itself to a fast pace. So the Rogers Lasney, the science fiction fantasy writer, said that um, when he was describing a character, he tended to, he tried to pick the couple details which would get the character, which would get the reader to, you know, visualize the rest for himself you know fill in the blanks and that's that's kind of how i approach description too although that's certainly not the only way to do it uh, another good piece uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing what i said i was going to do here but another good piece of uh, good advice of, of technical writing advice is um is to you know put the reader at the beginning the most reliable way to do that is probably with interesting action or dialogue Although if you're a really good stylist, maybe you can do it with an evocative description of the setting or something. But uh, the the way that almost never, I think, works to do it is to have like a big chunk of, you know, dry exposition about, you know, we're going to tell you the last thousand, about the last thousand years of this the history of this <laughs> game before we actually get to our characters and what's going on now. So anyway, there, there there's a few random pieces of, of, of technical writing and fiction writing advice as far as career advice and this is something that um this is something i've never actually managed to do successfully i guess <laughs> i mean or, 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 well i guess the jury's out whether i'll do it whether i'll <laughs> succeed doing it from now on we'll see but um, over the course of my career i've met a lot of people who have said you know if you will do this work you know invest if you do this work for no money up front you know down the road it's going to there's going to be this glorious project and you're really gonna you're gonna make out like a bandit at that point that's when we'll pay you when this thing succeeds and um or when this thing comes out and then um people in my experience you know it usually doesn't come out or it's nothing you know and you and you wind up having invested your your time and your work and, and not getting paid which is a really bad thing for a freelance writer yeah. who's, who's, who's trying to make it, you know? And um, so I, I wish that I had, uh, I wish I had learned early on to be more skeptical when somebody approaches me with a deal like that. But, um, you know, the last one was relatively recently. So I, <laughs> I, I guess that's a lesson I had not learned at that point. Maybe, who knows, maybe it'll turn out I haven't learned it even now, but um I mean, it's like uh, there are a lot of people out there who talk a good game, but are not really capable of uh, doing what they say they're going to do for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think I, I think each of those is a is a very valuable piece of advice. And on the last writing one that you said, I just thought it was interesting that you mentioned that um, with a hook because, um, like Whispers of Venom, the way you started that book, I just felt like what I was hooked right away. And that's one that always like really stuck with me. Um, And I just, it was such an interesting start to that story. I don't want to give it away for anybody because hopefully you guys will go and read it if you haven't yet. Uh, But that one to me really stood out. And it's one of the few books where I was really hooked on the hook, like right off the bat. Um, And then I felt like you had brought it together with the ending so well. And especially at that time, I just think that certain people had a good hook and then didn't end the book you know where the hook really made sense and um endings are hard like yeah, i mean they, really they, they're they are really um they're really hard i mean you see that in a lot of um you see that in a lot of action movies i think mm, yeah, yeah 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 that um it's, it's like the, the the final big fight kind of falls flat and it's because they've been so many interesting fights up to that point it's like well how do you top this you know yeah. and uh, and 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 cope with the fact that the reader that the viewer might have a little bit of action fatigue you know <laughs> I, I and i i definitely think that uh, you that you get something like that in kind of action adventure novels which is what i tend to write too that it's like uh okay i better come up with something really good at the <laughs> end and um and so you try and uh you know so it's, it's better than others i mean there are writers who are super successful who um have a rap for you know having weak endings so it isn't necessarily a 
you know, a, you know, means that you'll never succeed if, if you have that issue. But uh, obviously, it's better to have a strong, good, strong one if you can. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, I have real quick. So you actually mentioned um, some of these authors, I'm assuming. Uh, but who are some of your favorite authors that have inspired you to write? Okay, well, these are all, all mostly going to be, you know, older people, because I think because I'm an older person. And I actually think that the writers that mean the most to you and inspire you are, are the ones that you read when you're young, even though uh, you may read, uh, you may be tremendously struck by the merits of, of other writers as you as you're older but the ones that just kind of really live in your heart are the ones that you find when you're younger so for me it's like people like uh said fritz leiber robert e howard um carl edward wagner michael moorcock um uh, uh uh eddie grice but uh, i forget star already forgetting which one's already said um eddie grice burroughs uh paul anderson el sprague de camp uh th those are HP, I say HP Lovecraft. Uh, those are some of the people that, um, you know, that meant a lot to me when I was uh, was growing up. Uh, as far as writers who are still working now, I try to read everything that by Bernard Cornwell when it comes out. Mm. I try to read everything by Joe R. Lansdale when it comes out. A um, uh, couple contemporary horror writers that I think are just really, really good are... Um, John Langan and Paul Tremblay. I try to read all their stuff as it okay. comes out. So, uh, so there's some. Oh, that's cool. I definitely need more horror. I've been trying to to expand. I've been trying to get more horror writers on because, to me, like that is a type of fantasy, and you know, there's science fiction oh, yeah. elements there. I just the, the, you know the paranormal to me. Uh, oh yeah, well for horror too, of course, Ramsey Campbell. Mm. Not, to, mm. not to mention Ramsey Campbell. He's um, to me, he is like the best living horror okay. writer. Oh, that's cool. I have to check that. I have to check a couple of those books out. I'm heading to the library tomorrow, actually, for a, a new round. So I have to definitely check those out. Yeah, he's uh, doing so, a kind of a Lovecraftian trilogy right now. And the first, really? two, the first two are out in uh, the first two are out. And I, I got them, you know, as, as e-books and read them. And I'm um, wait, anxiously waiting for the third one to come out as an ebook and because uh, i've already got it pre-ordered in amazon oh, stuff cool. right on my device and i'll read it but i mean he's he's a really good writer he does and he writes it all he writes all kinds of um of, of horror in terms of uh you know most of, i guess more of it is supernatural than not but it's oh, cool. but i he's done some kind of straight up you know non supernatural suspense type horror too and he, anyway he's always great Oh, and like awesome. I said, for for horror, uh, uh, horror um, Langan and, and Tremblay are doing really interesting things. Langan did a book called The Fisherman, which I think is just an amazing novel. I, I can't recommend that one enough. I've definitely been uh, seeing that one making the rounds uh, the last, uh, actually, it's been really the last couple of weeks, especially. Um, it seems like there's, I don't know when that one came out, but it seems like. Years ago, now, I think. Oh, okay. Seems like quite a few of my friends have uh, discovered that one. So they've been getting me uh, a lot of the book reviewers that I know um, who normally only do fantasy and sci-fi uh, have really branched out into horror and, um, yeah. you know, paranormal and stuff like that. But that one's definitely been making it the rounds for whatever reason. Uh, the last couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of people uh, reading that one. So yeah, I would that. call it a horror novel, but it's definitely a, a supernatural novel, too. I mean, it'll uh, it'll that's, cool. that's probably give why. Your, your, it'll give you your fantasy fix at the same time. Oh, OK. So that's why. OK. OK. That makes sense to me. <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> I, yeah, I think, um, you know, I tried telling a lot of people I'm like, you know, for me, like fantasy and sci fi, it's like fantasy to me is is a lot of different things. I think a lot of people think, you know, especially authors think that oh, I can't go on that podcast because it's just fantasy. And I'm like, no, I'm like, well, what's your definition of fantasy? Like, maybe we have to expand it. And I just think that, you know, it, like, I think there's so many, you know, like you're, you know, like you're, again, you're Forgotten Realms books, you know, there's so many, you know, great supernatural elements there and, you know, so many horror elements. And I just think that, you know, they, you know, they really help make a story, you know, and they really help, like you were saying, you know, you have these different parts, but they, you know, you're really focusing on, you know, whichever, you know, thing you're doing at that time. But to me, it's like, there's just so many cool stories. I think that's why, you know, Stephen King's so popular, you know, and different people like different, 
things. And I think particularly in fantasy, you know, and I think a lot of grim dark lately has gone more, um, you know, into those elements. Um, like you were saying, you know, those Robert E. Howard elements, I think you can find a lot of those, you know, traits again in Solomon Kane and, you know, and think H.P. Lovecraft, you know, Mary Shelley, things like that with Frankenstein. Uh, but I think, you know, to me that those are still fantasy to me, you know, cause there's fantastical elements that are happening. And I don't know, I just, I think it's really interesting. And uh, you see a lot of those writers do, you know, do really well. And, you know, I, it's just interesting to me to, you know, to learn that because, you know, I've, you know, read books like yours, you know, where it's got a lot of those elements in it and, you know, H.P. Lovecraft and Stephen King, but I feel like I'm not very good at the horror part or supernatural part, I guess, uh, or the paranormal part, uh, which is funny because I study that stuff all the time, but it doesn't come naturally to me. So I think that's yeah. why to me, you know, in fantasy, it's, or sci-fi even, you know, with like alien and stuff, I was trying to explain to somebody the other day, you know, why I considered, you know, alien horror and they were like, why it's sci-fi. I'm like, well, it's a horror story in a sci-fi setting, which to me, makes it so much cooler but yeah horror to well, me always, supernatural is cool i always think of you know i would say that you know fiction is like one big pie and when you have your genre classifications that that that's a way of cutting the pie yeah yeah and and it can be it can be useful and uh you know it can lead us to some interesting discussions or whatever but you um but you should always remember that that's just one way of cutting the pie. Yeah, yeah. You know that it is. You could, um, you know, you could cut it a different way, and it would be potentially equally useful and equally valid. Like you know, we can say, oh well, this is you know, this is fantasy and this is horror and this is science fiction, if we want to. But we could also just like have one big piece that we said, you know, this is the genre of the fantastic. You know. Yeah, yeah. And it has science fiction and fantasy and supernatural horror in it. Then we'd have another piece of the pie that was um, that was you know non supernatural horror, and maybe that would we would cut that in a way that we would have like all all suspense novels in there. You know, it's um, you know it's just uh, just however you want to look at it, really. Yeah, well, I think even horror. Like, I think you make a great point. Like even horror, right? Like that's like a couple people ask me. They're like, "Well, I'm this and I'm that," and like a lot of the Amazon tags, I think you know, come down to it, but. But I'm like, well, you have a cool story. I'm like, you have a cool idea. I'm like, you tell a story, you know, really well. You know, I'm like, I just want to talk to you and figure out, you know, how your brain works and things like that. But right. yeah, it's interesting you say that because I saw this really interesting um, thing that a couple of libraries were doing. I think it's out in California. And they actually, you know, it's um, a lot of bookstores have done it the last several years um, where it's like, like a, you date a book or whatever. And they, you know, they cover the, the whole book and paper and they just write about what the book was about on the cover. And then you just, you take that one and go. And a I saw a couple of libraries do that. And they actually just mixed up all the genres. Um, and then they, you know, they just described what the book was. Um, and then you just did like a blind book date. And to me, that was really interesting because a lot of people, I like the, the reactions of the readers because a lot of people said, oh, this story sounds interesting to me reading the description, but without the classification, a lot of people end up reading books and loving books that they would have never picked up originally. So I do yeah. like how you said that. Sometimes it's helpful, but you know, sometimes it, 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 I think it does hurt certain audiences at times. And they think, oh, I can't read this because it's not you know, in my genre. And I think particularly on Amazon, it hurts because there's so many subgenres. Uh, and I think a lot of people, I just go with authors personally or story mm -hmm. ideas. You know, I just, I'll, I'll read anybody to be quite honest. Cause you, for me, it's like, you never know. I think the realms personally, helped me with that because instead of just reading, you know, Bob, you know, or your books, I, or Elaine's, like I got to read so many different authors, you know, and there were so many great characters and stories. And I think personally for me, it just set up, you know, being more acceptable, you know, accepting towards other people uh, who are newer or who I'd never heard of before, you know, cause I'd had so many good experiences with, you know, different trilogies or standalones or, you know, novellas or short stories within the realms. But I, I do think that, you know, sometimes the classifications, you know, definitely. So people always ask you, right? Like what genre is your book in? And I think now a lot of people I've talked to for writers are having, you know, trouble classifying themselves because they're like, well, I'm in here, but I'm also here. So I just think it's a kind of interesting thing that's going on recently. Well, of course it's tricky because the reason, part of the reason that genre classifications exist is because they're a marketing tool. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, you can do these kind of, uh, you can do these kind of slipstream stories, but um, 
ultimately, of course, you also you you also want to do something where the that can be labeled in such a way that the bookstore is going to sell the maximum number of copies and yeah, yeah. you know where to show, show it. So if you write something that's, um, you know, if you write something that's, uh, uh, you know, kind of kind of science fiction, but kind of horror, but kind of mainstream too, because it could all be hallucinatory or whatever. You know, it's, um, you know, it, they it could be a hard sell because. Publishers will say, well, we don't know how to market this. And the bookstores aren't going to know where to put it and stuff like that. That happens to some people some of the time. Oh, Although, yeah. of course, other people do, um, you know, other people have done these kind of slipstream books and they say, well, it's a slipstream book, you know, and, it, it's, and uh, you know, they figure something out and they say, well, it's good. We can, this is a marketing hook we can use for it. And it, it's all okay. I just think it's interesting that you say that because like it's Philip Pullman, I believe, right? The Golden Compass. And Every time, uh, you know, I've found one of those at a used bookstore at a library or at a, you know, Barnes and Noble, it's like they're in young adult, but then sometimes right. they're in sci-fi, but then sometimes they're in fantasy. And I think Anne McCaffrey's like that too. You know, a lot of people have put her in a fantasy, but, you know, she was saying drag her as a person is a sci-fi, you know, and that she always intended to be sci-fi. And to me, it's just, it's, it's really interesting to see, you know, how many books, The Golden Compass, you know, in that trilogy, you know, has sold, but still I'll see it in, you know, I feel like nobody really knows how to classify it. And it is well, interesting, I think, you know? I think it was originally published as young adult, wasn't it? I, I believe so, yeah. But yeah I, I think. I mean, I could be wrong that. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's kind of... Um, that's where it was when I was younger, when, you yeah. know, when I feel like they first came out. Like, for me, at least, they were in young adult. And then, you know, when I went to try and go find them uh, a little while back for a friend, now, yeah, now they moved them in sci-fi and I know a few years ago, I um, picked up a couple and I found them in the use section for, for fantasy. And uh, I've just talked to a lot of people who have said that had that same thing. And it, to me, it's just, it's interesting, right? Because a lot of people who, like you were saying, like, you know, some people it works really well for Slipstream, some people it doesn't. And I think that, you know, he's a good example of somebody that it worked really well for. Because again, you know, there, there are young adult elements, there's, you know, fantasy and sci-fi there. Uh, with the magic and science fiction um, but I just I always look at that one as um, when people you know especially eight or nine years ago for indie publishing we're talking about you know the different classifications on Amazon they're like it can't be done people can't slipstream like that but then you know you have this traditional published trilogy that you know sold millions and millions of copies and it's totally slipstream and to me it's just interesting over the last like you know several years especially to kind of see like where now people are kind of changing their tune on it but i think i think i don't know if it's like an amazon thing but it seems like um amazon helps you slipstream a lot more um you know well you can you know, put, put yourself in multiple categories yeah so yeah yeah if, uh, you know if, if you write something that's, something that's kind of fantasy and kind of yeah. science fiction kind of or you can you can tag it as all that and yeah uh, yeah i think that the um my impression is that I, I really don't know about the inner workings of Amazon, so I could be totally wrong about this. But I think that kind of the important thing about Amazon is to to if, is to get reviews. You know that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's kind of what makes your book when somebody logs onto Amazon and then and, and they say, "Well, I think I'll buy this," and Amazon always says, "Well, why don't you buy this too?" You know, and yeah, it's yeah. Like, that's that's how you get to be and this too. You know? Yeah, yeah. I found a lot of great books that way, honestly. And I, I've known a lot of people that have, you know, talked recently who have just gotten into, for instance, like Forgotten Realms on Kindle um, and have talked about that. They're like, oh yeah. And then this popped up and I do like that Goodreads does that algorithm too. And theirs isn't as good as, you know, Amazon's, but, um, you know, I do know quite a few people. Like I know when I was checking in what books I had read for the realms and which ones I still, you know, had on my shelf I wanted to read. And it was nice to keep track that way. And it was like, it just kept popping up more and more. So I didn't even have to search. It was like right. you know, all on that bar. And I do think it's smart that Amazon, you know, has done that and has spent a lot of, you know, money, time and, you know, research and energy into that algorithm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nice. I mean, it is nice, you know, if you go and, you know, look at your page, for instance, you know, you can actually see, you know, the different breakdowns and stuff of things you've done and, you know, the classifications for the genre. I do think it's helpful though, because for somebody like me, like I said, like, you know, I really liked your books because, you know, I, I think you could really classify it, you know, uh, differently than they did, you know, at the time. And I think Amazon does that a lot better now. So, you know, people that want those different elements, you know, who like fantasy, but, you know, they, maybe they don't want grimdark, but, you know, maybe they want fantasy with, 
you know, those types of different elements in it. And, you know, your Iron Kingdoms is another one too, you know, to be able to have steampunk and, you know, and magic, uh, you know, those fantasy elements, I, I still, you know, other than Warhammer, you know, there's still not a lot like that out there that I've seen, uh, you know, a lot of people at steampunk, you know, just classify themselves as steampunk or, you know, their subgenre is different. So right. to me, that's really cool. Cause that's how I found um, those books for you is kind of going through from your page. And then I kind of went and did a quick genre search and uh, those popped up. So to me, that was really helpful. Right. Yeah, yeah, cool. The only bad thing about the Amazon is, I mean, the other side of the coin is bad. Like if you've done a book that, if you've done something that, that didn't get um, many reviews, it's like, oh God, nobody's ever going to find it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're never going to show, they're never, it's never going to pop up on anybody's, uh, when anybody's looking at something else. So, but you know, that, but you know, that's the system. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do know, like I talked to a couple of people about that and, you know, um, yeah, I, I just think that like, if they can just figure out, I, I, that's why I like the Goodreads system because Goodreads doesn't, it doesn't give you books that like Amazon, as far as I know, that algorithm gives you other books that have been, you know, reviewed a lot that you would like, but Goodreads, as far as I know, their algorithm is just trying to find books you're interested in. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like with genre and things like that. And theirs don't, um, unless they changed it in the last three or four years since I've looked into this, but theirs just is off of interest rather than, you know, um, breaking it up into, you know, however many ratings it has. Cause I've had right. books that popped up who I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, like they've been older than the realms books, you know, and I'm like, oh, cool. You know, like I had never, you know, I hadn't really thought about it and it might only have, you know, like 400 reviews, but for a book that's been out since, you know, 1970s, it's like, that's not a lot of reviews, you know, and I was actually surprised that those were popping up, but, you know, there were a lot of cool books, you know, like David Gamow and things like that, um, you know, like his genre and uh, his niche that I never would have found if it hadn't been for the Goodreads. So I just think that Amazon, you know, I just wish that they would kind of think about that, you know, because, you know, I, I'm sure I'm going to love, you know, the, the ones you did for Iron Kingdom. So to me, like, I need an algorithm that helps me there, you know, and right. I, I just think that, yeah, I think that, you know, obviously, you know, anything can be improved upon, but yeah, that'd be one thing that I'd like to see more of. Cause I, there's an indie author that I just met who sold 15,000 copies of his first young adult book and it's young adult and fantasy. And I'm like, why well, buy those all the time? And I'm like, I've never heard of them, you know? And I'm like, that would have been, you know, somebody nice to, you know, and I was listening to you know, him and I, when we were interviewing, I was just like, listen back at it. I was like, this is kind of crazy that, you know, his, like, I, I talk to people all the time and I'm, I'm on so many sites, you know, and I, I mean, I met like 10 authors last night, you know, on Twitter in like five minutes and, you know, started, you know, saving stuff and things like that. But I just still think, you know, there is a lot out there, but yeah, I just, I think that the algorithm still could, you know, could still be improved upon. I'd like to see that in the future. Cause I don't want to just see things that have been reviewed a lot. I know Brandon Sanderson's out there, you know, or, right. Other, you know, I'd, I'd like to see some other people, you know, I have his books. So <laughs> it just, I, you know what I mean? I just, it'd be nice to see some people that, you know, you normally don't get to see because, you right. know, I, I just, I hate to miss a story, you know, that I just feel like, like the Gray Mauser, you know, to me, was just such a cool character. And, oh um, yeah, well, you know, I would have felt, I don't know. And like Paul, Paul, you know, Paul S. Kemp has the Hammer and Blade series. And, mm -hmm. you know, that never pops up. I just mentioned it in a realms thing today. I was like, well, if you guys like this, you know, with the Rambus Cal, I'm like, you should really read these books and, you know, it's his own world and stuff, but they're, they're phenomenal. And, you know, I had never discovered those. And I, you know, have so many of Paul's books, you know, online and, you know, things like that. And to me, it's crazy that I didn't know that he had even written in that, you know, for that series. Yeah. He did some Star Wars books too, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were good. But yeah, it's just crazy to, you know, to think of how about, how many good I always like my wife's always teased me she's like you buy too many books I'm like but what if there's that one story you know and I've had that happen <laughs> recently you know where I read something I was like that was so good and I would have felt gypped you know if, right um, you know just you know some things you discover years later and you're like ah why didn't I read this sooner you know find this book sooner but yeah I'd love to see that algorithm get changed a little bit but yeah uh, so of course the, their, their alg Amazon's algorithm is you know they aren't, they aren't trying to sell any particular book. They're trying to sell the most books. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're 
you can't really go to them and say, well, you aren't selling enough of my book. <laughs> and you, she used to have your algorithm change, so it shows my books more often, but uh, that, that's just not going to fly. Yeah. Well, I do feel like it was like that, like five years ago. I do think that, you know, there were more books I was actually interested in. Because to me, like, I was just talking to a buddy about, about that. And we were like, you know, he asked me, he's like, are you seeing books that you on Amazon Kindle, you know, that you really want to read? And I'm like, no, I'm really not. I'm like, I'm just seeing, you know, what other people want to read. Um, but him and I talked about, it. I thought I just made it up, but like we had talked about, you know, before, I guess they changed the algorithm to what it is today, where it was doing that, like Goodreads, where they had a system where it was actually showing you what, you know, what you wanted. And I don't know, I think it is an interesting take, right? Like, you, you know, because obviously they're, you know, they're a business and, um, you know, in a company and that's what they're doing. But I don't know, just to me, like, I feel like I buy more books on there. I buy more books on Twitter. I meet people, you know, like yourself and stuff. And I mean, obviously I already had your books, but, you know, like talking to you, I'm like, oh, well, you have some other books that I haven't bought that I'm like really excited to get, you know? And I just think like I buy more books talking to people, um, you know, through social media or interviewing them than I do on actually Amazon. I only go to Amazon to buy people's books that I already know or I've talked to or, you know, or things like that, or saw their books somewhere else. I honestly don't use that algorithm very much. And yeah, maybe it's just a me thing. But <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not, um, I'm not in a drought right now for things I need to read. So I guess it really right. doesn't matter. But um, for that last question there, I just want to make sure that I asked you this. Uh, uh, so what current projects, novels, updates, news, promos, anything that, you know, you have going on currently? Well, of course, I want to mention that, again, the, you know, the Rebels of Anaheim just came out from a Marvel Legends of Asgard novel. It's, uh, you know, buy it, give you a five-star review on <laughs> or an honest review, whatever. And uh, so, I mean, that's that's kind of the, the big thing right now. I expect in, uh, in the new year to have some other stuff that I can't really talk about yet. Um, the, um, I'm, except well i'm pretty i'll mention this i'm pretty sure that uh, there's a series that i contribute to called uh basil mobius it's oh, created by a, a guy named uh ryan Schifrin in, in hollywood it was, it was a really good guy and a friend of mine he, he if you saw the movie um tales of halloween he did one of the segments in that oh, that's cool uh the, you know he's a writer he's a director anyway he's created these these two years they're kind of like um it's kind of like the the gray master and fofford in oh that's cool in the modern world oh that's and, really cool um, and uh basically they have the, the, as their adventures the, the, as they adventure they are constantly bumping up against uh you know archaeological mysteries and things from oh, fringe cool. science and and uh you know and and, and you know weird folklore and, and you know, things like that and uh, anyway i've that that series uh tim zahn contributes to that series and oh, chris wow. jackson who i mentioned before and eric's got to be uh has done stuff for it um uh, anyway i'm pretty sure that that series will be continuing into the new year and that i will be writing more <laughs> stuff for it i guys have written, written a ton of stuff for it in the past and ryan has talked to me about uh well here, what what's the next book gonna be so that's gonna happen uh i've I've done, I've got pitches in, for, I've turned in a short story recently. I've got uh, uh, pitches in for another, a uh, pitch in for another short story. And, uh, in a, uh, you know, just, just kind of stay tuned. It, it's, uh, I always get asked this question at a time when I'm not able to talk about it. <laughs> well, that's great because it keeps people like, excited, like me, yeah. but, like, going to have to just check in, you know, you guys will have to be like me and just, you know, check Richard's social media pages and, you know, get those updates. Yeah. So. <laughs> Believe me, when it's coming, when it comes to something becomes available, I will pimp the shit out of it. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's really exciting. I'm really anxious to, uh, to see how those go. And I'm really anxious to uh, go down and order, you know, your, your latest two Marvel books. Um, and, you know, obviously pre-ordered the other one. Uh, so that's, yeah, I was, saw that you, you know, had done those. I was like, that is super exciting. And, you know, it's like, Kind of like when Bob did um, Vector Prime for Star Wars, and I was like yeah. taking two things I really like, and you know, with the author and putting them together, and I was like, yeah, let's do this. So that's how yeah, I've been a Marvel comics fan forever, so it's it's a really nice gig for me. 
Yeah, that's super cool. Well, I really want to thank you again, you know, for coming on, Richard. I, you know, oh, yeah. I'm glad to do it. Any, anytime yeah. you want me back, I'll be happy. To oh, come yeah, back. yeah. I'd love to have any time, any time, you know, maybe, you know, you got one of those things in the future, you know, we'd definitely like to help you with, you know, promoting okay. those things, you know, anytime we want people to feel like, you know, that this is a, you know, a space that they can come back to at any time and chat with us and, you know, get their, uh, you know, their projects and, you know, news and updates and things like that out there. Um, you know, yeah, that'd be great. Responsive, so. Yeah, so super cool. Uh, for our audience, you got to make sure, obviously, you know, uh, Richard, you know, wrote a lot of different books, you know, particularly in the realms. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm uh, everybody knows if they've watched the channel, I'm a huge realms fan uh, in Dragonlance. So they're near and dear to my heart. Uh, so make sure you go and check those out. You know, make sure you go check out everything that he's got on his Amazon page as well. There's some really good things, like I said, that I'm going to order uh, and haven't looked at before. So I'm really excited there. Um, make sure you guys, Check this video out. Obviously, if you guys have found, it's going to be on YouTube, uh, Spotify, uh, RSS feed. We have a couple other things that are going to. Uh, my tech guy actually messaged me earlier and said, please don't say anything about the other channels. But hopefully by the time this is out, we're on a couple other channels as well. Uh, you guys know you can always uh, check our website and my Twitter uh, to go back and look at past episodes and things like that. Uh, again, Richard, really want to thank you for coming on. Uh, it was, oh, it's been a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> sorry, I'm losing my voice. Uh, I, like I said, I'm a huge fan, Richard. So this has been a, a dream interview personally. Uh, so <laughs> really, you know, just been awesome to talk to you and get to learn some realms trivia and, you know, kind of see, you know, what other things you've written and things like that. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, getting your Marvel books and seeing, you know, what you've done in that world. And uh, I look forward to, you know, getting some of your past things that I haven't read as well. So really going to be looking forward to that. So uh, like I said, if you want to come back anytime, you know, I'll uh, send this right. to you and, you know, you're welcome back anytime, you know, just shoot me a, a email or a message on Facebook and, you know, we would be more than happy to have you back. Okay. Well, I'll be done. I'll certainly do that. Perfect. Perfect. Well, you have a great rest of the day, Richard, and good luck with everything with the, the, the pre-orders and things like that. I hope that, you know, yours just sell out of the stores. Well, thank you. Have a good rest of the day, and I will see you later on social media, my friend. Okay, so long. Bye.